All right. Well, welcome everybody to Views from the Capitol 2023 wrap up in November. Um, we are going to cover the issues that we've seen move this year, uh, things that are waiting for that 90 days after session adjourns for when they'll go into effect. Um, and we're going to talk about why we're already at sine die. So thanks for being here today. Um, if you were at ALC, a lot of this stuff is going to sound familiar, but maybe there's a question you didn't ask there. If you do have questions, please put them in the chat and we will get to them as we go. Um, and try to stay muted uh, because then it's easier to hear everyone else speaking. So I am Jennifer Smith, Director of Government Relations, and with me is our Assistant Director, Brenda Pilgrim, and our uh, multi-client lobbyist from Carew Associates, Matt Curta. And I am going to go to him first to talk about the recent city elections and why we went signy die already. Well, thank you, Jen, and good afternoon, everybody. Great to be with you. Uh, interesting times here in Lansing. We're entering a period of time that most of us have never seen. We have not seen the legislature adjourn early in an odd numbered year, I believe since 1967 or eight. Traditionally, the legislature, of course, is in for two year sessions. In the odd year, they do adjourn for the end of the year. However, that usually occurs in late December. And what that really means is they just return the following January. It's the middle of a two year session, but whenever the legislature adjourns, sign die is what they call it. Uh, they're gone for usually a few weeks and come back. Uh, this year that happened on November 14th. So that's a month and a half earlier than we've ever seen it before. There's a number of uh, political reasons why or why that, why or why not that did not happen. But what it means for us is uh, everyone is gone and the legislature is done for the year. They'll be back the second Wednesday in January. And to trot out a joke that I've used for years that always gets cheap laughs, they're not here and they can't hurt you. So what we're kind of focusing around right now is, uh, you know, John, and we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit, our bills that have been passed and how soon they'll take effect. With the legislature adjourning early for the year, what that means is the 90-day clock starts a little bit earlier than it otherwise would have for bills that did not get immediate effect in the legislature. Uh, what immediate effect means is a uh, bill takes effect 90 days after session ends for the year unless it gets two-thirds support in either chamber. Two-thirds support is gaveled on in the House, but in the Senate, there are a number of bills that did not get immediate effect, such as the para bills others will be talking about. So that 90-day clock now starts November 14th, as opposed to sometime in mid to late December. That just means a lot of bills will take effect, maybe in February, as opposed to, uh, to late March. So with that clock running, the other big news in town is we've had two special elections in Warren and Westland, as we've talked about before, both Democratic legislators in the House, Kevin Coleman in, War in Westland and Laurie Stone in Warren. They both won, they've resigned, they've taken over as mayor. So our house is tied 54-54 right now. So we've had a tied house in the past, I believe in the 93-94 session in the house or somewhere in that general time frame, we had a 55-55 house. But in this instance, while the house is tied, the rules that were put in place by the democratic majority mean that they can't make any changes in who the speaker is or any organizational type changes unless the house is tied 55-55. Uh, they did that because they knew this was likely to happen this November that they might be losing a few members. So in the interim here, uh, up until special elections are filled for both of those seats, we're running with a tied house, meaning Joe Tate is still the speaker, Democrats still control committees. However, for anything to move on the House floor, uh, you would need bipartisan support, assuming you have support of all of one caucus, uh, meaning you could have all 54 Democrats, but you would need uh, a Republican vote or two to move things forward. So things are probably gonna slow down a little bit. They're not gonna stop, they're gonna slow down. But the next thing on the agenda here politically in town is what's gonna happen in these two special elections the governor has called. Uh, we just got these last week. She of course couldn't call the special elections until the local mayoral elections were certified. So January, and pull up my dates here, January 30th is the primary election for both of those seats and then April 16th, is going to be the general election for both of those seats. So you have to have partisan primaries, then general elections in April. 
They're both uh, solid Democratic seats. Uh, you know, not comp I would say pretty safe. You know, who knows what can happen. Uh, the filing deadline is four o'clock today after she just announced the elections last week. So um, it, it's a pretty short turnaround for the clerks to take care of. But we have to assume that the various caucuses knew this was coming and they've been recruiting candidates. So stay tuned for news this week on what candidates are running. But most likely we'll know the field here at four o'clock. Candidates, of course, have time to withdraw. We'll see how that drama works out. But we're probably going to have the House back to Democratic majorities on April 30th. And so what does that mean once we get to April 30th? We're right in the thick of budget season. We're going to be in the thick of an election season. Uh, April is when we have the filing deadline for next year for all the seats in the House that are going to be up. The Senate's not up. So we could probably expect a lot of activity once the Democrats regain majority of the House next spring until they leave for the summer to hit the campaign trail. Remember, they have to get the budget done. And we're coming out of a very partisan atmosphere here as Democrats have been in charge of everything for the first time in 40 years. So a lot has happened this year. And with a lot happening on one side, you can imagine uh, the side in the minority probably is, is not too enthused uh, with what has happened, but we'll see what happens over the next few months. So split party control in the House here, at least until April should be an interesting adventure. But right now, I think what we'll talk about is uh, bills that have been signed into law, what we see coming up on the horizon. And uh, also, I would note that budget preparation is underway right now for the governor to unveil her budget in February. So that's probably the busiest thing going on here behind the scenes, as well as evaluating everything uh, that's been signed into law thus far. So with that, that's kind of the overview of what we've been following up on. We'll get into the weeds on some bills that are of interest. But uh, I'm going to stick around. I'll be here the whole time to answer questions. I uh, certainly have enjoyed working with uh, all of you and with Jen and Brenda over the uh, last year or so. It's been quite the year, quite the busy year. We've had a lot going on. Uh, some good things, some things we disagree with, but it's been a busy time uh, in public education. So, Jen, at that point, I'll uh, take a break, take a breath. Happy to answer questions now or later, and I will hand it back to you. All right. Any questions for Matt right now? Okay, so as he said, sine die is that kickoff to the 90 day clock for bills that didn't receive immediate effect. And that was the one power thing that the Senate Republicans had is in a 2018 Democratic majority, the one thing they could do was withhold immediate effect if they didn't like the bill. So we have a handful of bills that went into effect already, but we've got a lot more that are waiting for that 90 day clock, which will hit about February 12th. So we're gonna go through some of those, um, the ones that are education related. There's mountains of more that are sitting around waiting for this clock. There's gonna be a lot of laws going into effect in February um, across all sorts of issues. But we'll start with Senate Bill 12, which was one of the first public acts she signed. It was Public Act 7. This repeals the mandatory retention for third graders not reading at grade level. So it maintains all of the third grade reading law, all of the supports, all of the supports that follow the kid, all of that, but it removed the piece that said you must retain the child unless they have an exemption um, if they're not reading up at grade level. So that was one of the very first things that they got done, but won't go into effect until February. So it didn't affect last year's third graders. It starts with this year's third graders. <laughs> Senate Bill 169 is not signed yet, but expected to be. Um, this was passed in the last few hours of November before they went sine die. And it requires a public employer to share the personal information of a new public employee within 30 days of hiring them. So we argued against this bill because under the US Supreme Court Janus decision, right to work despite Michigan passing or repealing right to work, it doesn't affect public employees. Public employees still cannot be mandated to join a union, so they are still under the right to work law until the Supreme Court changes at the federal level. But this requires information, personal information, the name, address, phone number, home address, home email, wages, step, work location, um, and I think a few other things, all has to be shared with the bargaining unit within 30 days of hiring that employee. 
And we had argued that this is a bad way to start a uh, relationship with an employee that may not want to be part of the union. But the um, the bill went through anyway. And so that will start in February. House Bill 4001, the very first bill introduced in the House. Um, this is the one that phases out the income tax on your pension tax or on your pension and retirement income. And it increases the earned income tax credit. So that will finally go into effect. And the we sort of stayed out of this argument. We have fought against the repeal of the pension tax for years because it's a it's a good chunk of money to the school aid fund off of the pension tax. But what they did instead is they changed the formula for what the school aid fund will receive from the pension tax so that we receive more of the income tax money overall, even as the pension tax goes away. So it was truly held the funds in the school or the revenues to the school aid fund harmless. So we could wash our hands and walk away and watch from afar. Um, but that will affect many of you that have a public pension. Um, that started getting taxed in 2011, and now that will um, phase out. 4007, which was Public Act 10, reenacts prevailing wage laws. There is language in it, sloppily written, and we're trying to get it fixed, um, that it won't affect your current projects. So current bonds that were passed before February of 2024 will fall under the contracts and the wages that you expected to pay. Anything after February 2024 and prevailing wage comes into effect. So we're working on cleaning that language up to make sure that it is crystal clear that that's how it applies. There are questions right now, um, but that's the intent. So prevailing wage will go into effect for anything that has a state dollar attached to it at all. And um, that will start mid-February. 4166 repeals the A to F uh, accountability system for schools. If you remember when we passed this, we fought against it because it was redundant. Um, it did not qualify under federal law as an accountability system. So we had this A to F system plus the accountability system we already have in place that the feds use and the, the feds have okayed. Um, and we have that my school data where you can find anything you could want about a school. So it really was just a redundant way to use um, standardized tests and things like that to grade our schools. So that will be repealed starting in February. House Bill 4233, this reverses a 2012 law that said that public schools could not withhold union dues from employee paychecks. We opposed this when it went through because it was only aimed at schools. This was not done because they thought it was a good public policy. It was done to get after the MEA. And because of that, we opposed it. So we did support the repeal. Um, so if your school so chooses, um, they may withhold union dues directly from the paychecks like they were doing before 2012. And it is a may, not a shall. 5021 was another one that passed at the very end of session. This changes the default retirement option for new hires. So currently, when you are hired into a school district, you have 75 days to make your decision on which retirement system you want to be in, the true, the strictly 401k or the pension plus, which is pension and 401k. And if you don't make a decision within 75 days, then you default directly to 401k. This was supported by ORS, the Office of Retirement Services, which as you've probably heard me talk about before, they're not always supportive of changes we're trying to make to MIPSERS. But this one they were because it gives people more flexibility as they go forward. If they're in the pension plus 401k, if they wanted to go total 401k. But once you make the decision, you can't switch systems. So this will allow for people who don't make the decision within those 75 days to default into the pension plus. So they have a pension and a 401k um, and within when they're first hired. And then a couple of the big ones. Senate Bill 395 was just signed by the governor on Tuesday of last week uh, or Wednesday of last week. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the changes to the teacher and evaluation laws. And this makes a lot of changes we had asked for, a few that we didn't love, but that's the nature of negotiation. Um, in the end, we ended up supporting it because they did create a threshold for 
uh, student growth. When these bills were first introduced, it wiped out student growth completely, including using the MSEP, which we fully supported. We never should have been using the MSEP as for student growth. So by the end of the negotiations on this, the law, the bill that went before the governor said that 20% of your evaluation must be based on student growth, but that student growth determinant is determined by the, the criteria is determined by the locals. And as you remember in our next thing we're gonna talk about too, evaluations are now bargainable. So you will be able to bargain with your teachers to determine what growth measures you're going to use. And then that has to be used for 20% of the evaluation. It also changes the rating levels to effective developing and needing support. If an administrator or superintendent receives three effective ratings for three consecutive years within the same district, you can move them to a biannual evaluation rather than an annual evaluation. And it's a can, you don't have to, but it allows that to happen after three effective ratings. For teachers after three effective ratings, you can move to biannual or triannual. And that was a big piece that the principals had wanted because that way they can take their effective teachers that have been effective year after year after year and not have to do all of the legwork for the evaluations and they can focus on their other teachers in their buildings. And so that was a time-saving piece that the principals had really wanted. If you receive a needing support after two consecutive evaluations of needing support, you can request, or sorry, let me start, take a step back. After receiving a needing support, which is the lowest level evaluation, you can request a review. If you're not happy with the review, if the teacher is not happy with the review, they may request mediation. It does not have to be granted, but they may request it. After two needing supports, they may demand binding arbitration. For That's for everyone except the superintendent. So the superintendent, it now states that as you renew, extend, or establish a contract with the superintendent, it must include a clause for some way to appeal their evaluation rating. They don't fit neatly into this bucket of mediation and binding arbitration because they're not within a bargaining unit. So this was the way to still give them an ability to have due process like they were trying to establish for the teachers and building level administrators, but it'll put it on um, board members and the incoming superintendent or the superintendent you're renewing to figure out that language that you wanna put in there. And I'm sure as we go forward, there will be some guidance and some help that will come out of our legal department. And you can always call and ask them too when you get to that point. It still says that after three consecutive needing support ratings, that it leads to dismissal of the staff member. And that was in the old law that continues into the new law. That new law goes into effect July 1st, 2024, and with the 24-25 school year. So there is some time to adjust for that. And it means it does not affect this school year. Um, that's always been an issue with evals and timing, but this law will not affect the 23-24 school year. It does not go into effect until July 1st of 2024. And then finally, we have PARA. And you heard a lot about this as we went forward with it. There are um, a handful of bills, starting with 4044. This repeals the law that says if your contract expires, that step increases and insurance costs freeze too. If so, with it repealed, if your contract expires, now your step in increases and insurance coverage continue as if there was still a contract. And this is gonna play in even more because of 4354 and 4356, which put eight prohibited subjects back on the bargaining table. And this includes evaluations, privatization, and then the big three that we are working on so hard, uh, teacher placement, layoff and recall, and discipline and discharge. All of those things are back on your bargaining table. If your superintendent has not been involved in bargaining since after 2011, they will have no idea what they're in for. If you have been involved in your collective bargaining before 2011, you need to help. You need to, to talk about what it was like, what you did at the table, things you talked about, things you negotiated to give a picture to those who weren't here. It's been 12 years that these have been prohibited subjects. 
So not everyone has dealt with this before. So for those people who have, um, we really look to you to help your boards and superintendents navigate this. Um, it's gonna be a big deal this, this spring. This all goes into effect early February, just before you're gonna start negotiations. Um, so just be aware that that's out there. Um, our legal department, again, Brad and Dan have done presentations on this. They have presentations, they have information if you need it. Um, I encourage you to lean on them and your own legal team at your district. Um, but really, for those of you that were around before 2011, this is where your institutional knowledge becomes really helpful, um, especially because we know there are not a lot of superintendents out there that were here before 2011. So those will be a big deal. The other thing is 4820, which was the law that uh, sort of governed layoff and recall, and it had what we called the BB factors. So a list of factors that you had to consider that had been established by court law, I think back in the 70s, they wiped those BB factors out of this bill. So they're no longer in law. And they added teacher placement to, to that section. So now for teacher placement and layoff and recall, you can only consider length of service in a grade or subject area, um, <laughs> additional certifications or training, um, and then seniority can, oh, and evaluation. Those are your three factors. And then seniority can only be used as a tie-breaking factor. It is not to be the sole factor. This bill was brought in because our big argument about putting a lot of these things back on the table is that we that you'll you'll see districts start to move back to seniority based systems, and that's not good for students in a lot of cases. So their compromise was to put in the bill seniority cannot be the sole reason. Um, it doesn't really do what we asked, um, it, but that's what we got. So those are the big bills. Um, that you're gonna face in February and as you head into your bargaining um, time. Any questions about any of those before I move on to things that are already law that we just wanna tout and be proud of? Jennifer, can you repeat the three things again that you just mentioned? Like the service, eval, certification, did I get them all? Yep, length of service in the grade level or subject, their evaluation rating, and if they have additional certifications. Thank you. Or specialization. The grade level part of that. So thank you. Yeah. The info about evaluations be on the MESB website. Yes, we'll get some of that up there. Um, our leadership team is also working on adjusting our tool for the superintendent. Um, and they were involved with us as we worked through these issues and negotiated this bill. So they are already working toward getting um, our tool to reflect the new language and the new growth. Um, so our tool should be up to date um, before that February 12th. Well, sorry, before July 1, because um, like I said, this doesn't affect um, this year. So all of the updates that we'll have to do to the MASB tool and anyone's tools out there will have to be done before July 1. Um, and I'm sure that as we go forward, they will also be doing things probably after we get through this evaluation season because we don't wanna cause confusion. So I think you'll see more out of MASB on the evaluations in the summer leading into the new school year with the new law. Any other questions? All right, well, some of the things that we wanna talk about that we are like really excited that happened this year, one was the budget. This was one of the best budgets we've seen, um, at least in my time. And you saw a lot of our legislative priorities reflected in it. Things like money for, continued money for mental health and school safety, um, continued funding for student teacher stipends and um, teacher scholarships for those that want to go to college to be teachers. We saw a big chunk of money go into MIPSERS to help pay that down. Um, and then we also saw the free meals for all. And we're already well into the school year and we MDE has said 100% of districts across the state are taking advantage of the free meals for all program. 
but we are also still talking about the forms and MDE, re we rebranded them in the beginning of the year to be educational benefit forms instead of free and reduced lunch forms. And that is helping to get more parents to fill them out. But we know it's going to be difficult this year for you to get your parents to fill it out. And we just urge you to do all you can because those forms mean so much more than free and reduced lunch. Those forms set your pupil count for your at-risk kids at the state level, for your Title IA kids at the federal level. It affects TANF funds at the federal level. Um, it's just, there's so many things that those counts go toward that while feeding all of our children is a great thing, we need to figure out what to do about the forms. And that's gonna be a long-term project and one that we're already talking to MDE about. And MDE is already talking to the six other states that are doing this as well, as well facing the same issues. We'll need a change at the federal level really for how we count our economically disadvantaged kids before we're gonna be able to get rid of the forms at the state level. So we just consistently remind you to find ways to get those forms, find, find ways to get more families to fill them out. Um, and then don't be surprised if there is a small dip in the at-risk funding for this year because of this shift in thought about the forms. So, <laughs> So the forms are still super important while we work on what else can we do is how else can we count our economically disadvantaged kids. And there have been some ideas that have been thrown out there, like using census tract data, but that is 10 years behind and doesn't take into account schools of choice. So that's not a solid way. So there's conversations that are have that are happening. Um but again, it's going to have to take a federal shift as well, because even if Michigan figures out this is how we're going to count our economically disadvantaged kids, you still have to have the form for the feds. So this is going to be a long term project. And we're not the only state in this boat. Every state that is doing this is facing the same thing we are. Um, but I do think it's going to be a conversation we're going to have to keep raising at the federal level and making noise about to make them start thinking about different ways of how we can count um, kids. But know that the the MD department in charge of this, the woman in charge, her name is Diane Golzinski, and I can't say enough nice things about her. Um, she is so passionate about this and so dedicated to this and has been working on it since the day the governor announced it. So know the work is happening. It's just, this is gonna be a heavy lift and it's gonna take some time. So in between, get those forms filled out to the best of your ability. There's a question about new bargaining language that should already be available through um, our legal department. They have been doing um, trainings and presentations on that since it passed back in March. So if you can't find it there, then contact Brad Benassik or Dan Feinberg, and I'm sure they'll be happy to get it to you. Another bill we're really excited to finally have signed into law was Senate Bill 63, and this is um, sinking funds for school buses, a thing we've been fighting for for years and years and years and years. We finally got it. So you can use your sinking funds to purchase school buses or the maintenance of the school buses, but it has to be a sinking fund that was passed after August 6th of 2023. Anything passed before that is under the past law and you can't amend that to do buses. We ran into this when we did school safety and technology, so we already know the answer. But anything passed after the effective date of that bill, which was August 6th, anything passed after that, your sinking fund can be used for buses. Senate Bill 66 uh, goes into effect with the 24-25 school year, and this requires age-appropriate materials related to sexual assault and harassment to be given to all students in grades six through 12. The materials are supposed to be developed for you. They will just have to be distributed. Senate Bills 161 and 162 went into effect at the end of July, and these create reciprocity for out-of-state and out-of-country teachers and counselors. They will still have to meet Michigan standards, but they don't have to start over. They can bring their certificate from the other state and then show that they meet the rest of the Michigan standards that aren't covered by theirs, and they can move forward. This makes it a lot easier for teachers and counselors that are moving to move into Michigan and be able to go to work um, right away versus having to take all the different years that are required of education in Michigan. House Bill 4120 
Um, this deals with your mandatory reporters of child abuse and neglect, which all school employees are. Um, there's con comprehensive training materials are being developed, uh, more comprehensive than you have now. And those will have to be distributed to all mandatory reporters um, beginning in last September. So two months ago. And then finally, 4752, this changes the rules about returning to work after retirement. Um, if you remember last session, we passed this law that allowed you to come back after retirement, but you had to sit out for nine months before you could return or you would forfeit your uh, retirement benefits. This changes that to say after a uh, bona fide separation, which is generally 30 days, you can return to work as long as you do not make more than $15,100 per calendar year for the first six months. After six months after you retired, you can work in any position and make any amount of money. But those first six months after retirement, a person cannot make more than $15,100 in a calendar year, nor can they be employed as a superintendent. So even if a superintendent retires, they cannot return in those first six months as a superintendent. They have they could return in another capacity, but they cannot return as a superintendent until that six months has expired. This was a weird thing that was added at the very end, and it only affects the superintendency. Uh, but at least we've loosened these rules. They will be in effect for five years, and then we will have to revisit it. If they expire at five years, we go back to the nine months sit out. The idea was we're trying to do these things to help with uh, shortfalls and staffing, and this would um, this helps band aid it, and maybe we don't need the band aid in five years. So we will revisit that in five years. But for now, we've gotten some room for people who retire to be able to return to work um, and help serve our districts. Any questions about any of that? All right, I'm gonna turn it to Brenda for bills that we're watching coming in the new year. Um, the first one I wanna bring forward is um, Bill 463, which is the um, FAFSA requirement for graduation. Um, the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid for, student, for graduates who are going to college or maybe going into a trade school or something like that. In order, the, the bill is now, um, has been approved by the Senate, but is in the House for um, Committee for Education. And the goal is, is for every graduating senior to complete the FAFSA. We do not support that as a uh, graduation requirement, as it's beyond the control of the student. And there are many reasons why a student may choose not to fill out the FAFSA. Um, it could be a choice of the parent. It could be that they are in um, foster care. There are many um, different avenues. Um, it puts the onus on the student and with that, that's something that we do not support because it is beyond their control. Um, another bill that is um, in play is um, 500 and that is to codify the free school lunch program. Um, in order, if we codify, that means that it must be in the budget and it cannot be taken away. Um, as you know, right now, uh, free lunch and free breakfast are, are a boon, a boom for our students, and we would like to continue to focus on that. Uh, the approximate cost will be $160 million a year, but again, we would like to see that codified. Um, Bill 4671, um, which has been an ongoing issue, is to remove the ban for, for Labor Day start. Um, over 80% of the school's um, districts within the state of Michigan already have a waiver so that they can start before um, Labor Day. This has been moved to the floor, it came out of the Education Committee, but there has been some pushback from some of the representatives and it has not moved forward. So we expect to see um, action on that um, come, the, come the new year. Uh, another bill is um, 4928, which is a bus camera-based violation. 
that means that uh, cameras will be on buses and if people pass buses that are stopped, I know that surprises you all that people would do that. Um, they would be um, captured via photograph and turned in into the um, authorities so that they can pay a civil fine as far as the ticket is concerned. If they do not pay the civil fine within five days, they are referred to the Secretary of State. And when they go to get their license renewed or their plates renewed, um, they won't be able to. So that's another one. And then um, 5269 is one that we're very excited about, which amends the um, school code so that uh, charter schools will have to be will have to, just as public schools do, post the salaries of teachers and administrators. Uh, it will put us on equal footing, um, nothing that we're not asking our schools already to do so that we can compare apples to apples and know where the funding is going. Those are the bills that we're looking at for um, starting in January. Are there any questions? They're pretty basic. Okay, there are some issues coming up that um, we may see, I, and we don't know what those are gonna look like exactly. So one of them is the Open Meeting Act. Uh, during COVID, we were able to um, have people zoom in and, and continue meetings and, and not slow down the processes. The goal is, is that there will always be a requirement of um, physical quorum so there has to be a physical quorum in the room. However, it is um, working with the Michigan Township Association, the Michigan Association of Counties and the Michigan League, um, Michigan Municipal League, that people would be able to Zoom in in order to be a part of the meeting. However, you cannot use that Zoom person coming into the meeting to have quorum. That's um, um, a moving thing right now. It is in process. Uh, we don't know what that will look like in detail, but that's the basic gist of where they're headed as far as the Open Meetings Act. The ACT work keys. Um, the goal is to have a student be able to request um, the work keys. Uh, if they choose to request it, the school system will be responsible in making that available. The same for the ACT. Um, the, the requirements is there, but it should be optional if the, the student requests to take it. So work keys will be available. And lastly, they're looking at dyslexia. There's a lot of um, movement in that as far as um, helping helping with screening between ki kindergarten and third grade so that teachers are aware of what to look for indicators of so that it can be caught early and not just at one point within the third grade reading. That is um, something that's coming forward from Jeff Irwin and um, Senator Paul Hankey, and we will see what that looks like. It will also mean additional training, but again, these bills are in play, and we'll see what comes from that within in January when the session um, goes back into or comes back into session. Any questions? Okay. All right, thank you, Brenda. Are there other issues that we didn't cover that you're curious about? And while you're thinking, um, I put in the chat a link to two dashboard articles that have a lot of detail. Um, the first one is about the admin and teacher evaluation law. And the second one is was just in our November 15th dashboard. So if you still have dashboard in your emails, you can find it there too. Um, and that is on the uh, prohibited subjects that are being repealed. So both of those have a lot of information in them and contact information for the people who wrote the articles. 
Um, so you should be able to find what you're looking for. Um, hopefully you can find what you're looking for in those articles. And I see there is a House bill on how ISD board members are elected. There is a bill that was just introduced um, that says that ISD members would have to be publicly elected. We saw this a few years ago with Pam Hornberger. We fought it at that point because law currently allows you to decide as an ISD whether or not you are going to be elected by your constituent districts or elected by the public voters. Law allows you to make that decision. So if, if ISDs feel that's the way they need to go, they can go that way. And we currently have three in the state that are publicly elected. Um, so we don't see a reason for changing this. Um, we also think that sometimes this is mis- construed that the ISD truly serves the constituent districts, not necessarily everyone in the public. And that's the difference between electing local school board members and electing ISD members. Um, so we're hoping that doesn't get much traction. Um, we haven't heard anything about it other than seeing it introduced, um, but you'll be sure to hear about it if we start to see it moving. <clears throat> Any other questions, issues you're worried about that we could help with the legislative front? All right, well, we will do a news from the Capitol on Friday that will have the link to this recording so you can share it with anybody who missed it or rewatch it when you're bored, whatever you wanna do. Um, We'll include the links to those two articles in news as well, just in case. Um, if you're not receiving news from the Capitol on Friday, and there wasn't one last Friday, so don't let that throw you off, but the Friday before there was, if you're not receiving it, please let us know. Um, as most of you know, our advocacy system is separate from our membership system. So there is always issues when we're transferring emails between systems. So if you're not receiving it, please let me know um, and we will make sure that we get that settled and check with your fellow board members, especially the new ones and make sure that they're getting it as well. Um, we will do news, as I said, this Friday, and then you probably won't hear from us again, maybe once in December, but if something comes up and you have questions, feel free to reach out to Brenda or I, We're happy to help, but with no session, we don't wanna clog your emails unnecessarily. So if we don't talk to you before then, have a great holiday season and a wonderful new year. And we will send you another message back in January to let you know that they're sort of coming back. Thank you for being here today and have a great week.